Elon, you've been very vocal about the possibilities of colonizing other planets, specifically Mars, and right. your own company is doing a lot of work to get us to the stage where we're able to do that. Do you think that starting a colony on Mars would kind of be a chance to start over and maybe do a little bit better? Or do you think it's a chance to copy what nature on Earth has already created for us? Yeah, I think it's quite likely that we'd want to bioengineer new organisms that are better suited to living on Mars. Um, I mean, humanity's kind of done that over time uh, by sort of selective breeding. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, cows didn't evolve in the wild. Right. Um, but that's a very slow process, requires, you know, hundreds of generations. Uh, whereas I think with actual bioengineering, you could make that happen a lot faster, maybe with more precision. Ideally, long term, um, although this is a tricky subject, you'd want to write genetics. What do you mean by that? Meaning you wanna, you'd want to create synthetic organisms. Completely synthetic organisms. Not necessarily completely, but uh, you know, start with some base and then modify stuff. In the interest of colonization of other planets, um, are you relying on the research of government-funded space programs on the effects of you know, being in space for long periods of time, or does SpaceX have any interest in doing its own research? Well, I, I think the, the verdict is in with respect to long-term uh, existence in, in space, R really mostly well, about so zero-g. In my opinion, it is defining certainly. Defining long-term, too. Uh, well, certainly um, more than enough to get to Mars. Okay. You know, Mars is, if you, if you have a low energy trajectory, like minimum energy trajectory, it's about six months. Um, I think that can be compressed down to about three months. Um, and it gets exponentially harder as you go lower than that. Three, three to four. Um, I mean, it, and it's important to actually be at that level because then you can uh, send your spaceship to Mars and bring it back on the same uh, orbital synchronization. So um, Earth and Mars sync up every two years. Um, and then they're only kind of in, in sync for about six months. So, you, you know, and, and then you know, they're, they're really too far apart. So you've, you've got to be able to go there and back in one go. Um, and uh, and that, that's important for making the cost of traveling to Mars an affordable amount. Because you think of like, what's the key thing to establish a colony on Mars? It's, it's, the, it's the cost per, per unit mass to the surface of Mars, um, or the cost per person um, as well. At a certain a level, if it's too high, obviously they'll know there won't be such a thing, but if once it gets to a certain level, it will have the, it's like a reaction, you know, the activation energy is sort of like the economic activation energy of a Martian colony. Um, and uh, I mean, right now it's like, a tr I don't know, if, the, the last NASA estimate was, was $500 billion, and that was during Bush the first. So, so I would imagine uh, today's estimate is a trillion. Um, now we're not gonna go spend a trillion dollars on sending like four people to Mars. Um, so right right now, the cost of going to Mars is beyond beyond what can be afforded. So there's like that's why there's like no no one's going to Mars. Um, uh, but ultimately, in order to establish a colony, I think you've got to get the cost down to maybe half a million or less per person to go. And th there's got to be an intersection of sets of people that can afford to go and people that want to go. What was the moment that you decided that this was your mission, and how did you make that decision to investigate? So, Philip, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, in my case, when I was when I was 10 years old, um, uh, my father was incarcerated. He had uh, threatened someone with a gun. Um, in Switzerland, it's a very bad idea to threaten a banker with a gun, mm -hmm. and he um, he had a, a drug in his system, a sleep uh, drug which um, was found then later on to create quite a few side effects, inc including extreme violence. And his case was reopened. He was the first person to be pardoned by the, by the cantonal parliament in Geneva unanimously. And at the time, I thought, you know, he, he got away with it. He had a very good attorney. And I was trying to, to be sort of clinical about the whole thing. Um, ironically, 15 years later, uh, I'm doing a PhD on, on sleep. I challenged uh, one of my, my professors. I said, you know, what if I... I uh, used this particular drug, for example, in mice, just to see his reaction. He said, Philip, you can't use this. It makes people psychotic and aggressive. So once I had heard this 15 years later, you know, I, I thought, OK, this is uh, perhaps, perhaps my father was not, as, you know, or was not guilty at all. So uh, it was interesting. My first reaction was to pick up the phone and uh, apologize 15 years later to my father that 
you know, I had doubted uh, his innocence. I thought you were just bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it was interesting. And now, of course, we're helping some pharmaceutical companies come up with cleaner drugs. You know, that's exactly what we do. So it's really a very personal motivation. I, I guess it, I guess I guess it, it is, but I didn't realize that it was until I actually had been I, I had begun doing it. Thank you for sharing that. So I guess I'll ask you the same question, Elon. Like, what what's what drives you? Like, when did you realize that this work was important? And sort of, what's your personal motivation behind it? I wouldn't say I wouldn't say there was like one. It wasn't any one particular moment. I mean, there's certainly many people that I admire in history. Um, you know, Tesla, well. Tesla obviously <laughs> being one of them. Yes. Um, I think it stems because I had this like existential crisis when I was a kid, and uh, and tried to figure out what's it all about. And, conf and none of the books I read seemed to actually have a good answer. You know, so I said I read all the religious texts and I read a bunch of philosophy books, and they're all quite depressing, um, <laughs> particularly the Germans. <laughs> um, actually, when I read uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I thought, okay, this is a pretty good one. Um, you know, just to sort of try to uh, gain greater enlightenment over time, that seems like a good goal. Because we don't really know what the meaning of, the, of, the, of life is, um, but, or even really what the right questions are to ask, but if we can uh, improve our understanding of the universe, then eventually we can figure out what the right question to ask is, uh, you know, if it's not meaning of life, it's something, you know. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you, Elon and Philip, for joining me here and sharing your thoughts about consciousness and enlightenment and technology and where we're going. I really appreciate it. So thank you so much.